Let us pray. Lord, we have come to you this day, bringing all that we have, our lives, our hopes and dreams, our fears and our sorrows. We place these before you in faith and hope, knowing that no matter what has happened, you are with us and blessing us. Open our hearts to receive your words and your spirit, that we may find healing and comfort. Open our lives to the wondrous possibilities for service and joy that you offer to us. Amen. Hear these words from the Old Testament 
book of Deuteronomy, chapter 6, verses 4 through 9. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and your gates. This is Sunday, November 8th, the Sunday uh, prior to Veterans Day, which is this coming Wednesday. And that's a day that we as a nation take time, pause for a moment to thank all those who have served proudly this nation uh, here and abroad. So we offer this song this morning. And when we do it in person in the congregation, as we recognize our veterans, we invite you when you hear the branch of service where you've served for you to stand proudly. And we normally will clap as you rise. So today, wherever you are, how, however uh, you're situated today, I encourage you to stand as you hear your branch of service and know our gratitude. Over hill, over dale, we will hit the dusty trail. The army and the caissons go rolling along. In and out, hear them shout, counter marching all about, and those caissons go rolling along. And it's high, high E in the field artillery. Count out your numbers loud and strong. One, two, for where you go. You will always know that those caissons go rolling along. And the Navy anchors away, my boys, anchors away. Farewell to college joys, we sail at break of day. Our last night 
on shore. Hail to the foam until we meet once more. Here's wishing you a happy voyage home. And our Coast Guard, we're always ready for the call. We place our trust in thee to howling gale and shot and shale to win the victory. Semper Paratus is our guide, our pledge, our motto too. We're always ready, do or die. I Coast Guard, we fight for you. And the Marines from the halls of Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli. We will fight our country's battles in the air, on land and sea. First we fight for right and freedom and to keep our honor clean. We are proud to claim the title of United States Marines. Our Air Force, off we go into the wild blue yonder, climbing high into the sun. Here they come, zooming to meet our thunder. Adam, boys, give her the gun. Down we dive, spouting our flame from under, off with one terrible roar. We live in vain, or go down in flame. Hey, nothing can stop the U.S. Air Force. America, America. On thee and crown thy good with brotherhood from sea to shine Let us pray. Oh God, we give you thanks today for our nation's veterans. We honor them for their faithful service to our country and for what they have done to defend and preserve our freedom. Generation after generation, young men and women have answered our country's call and their lives have been changed forever. We are grateful to all who have served, whether in peacetime or in conflict. But today we especially remember those who have been tempered by fire, those who continue to bear wounds of the body or the spirit as a result of what they endured. They lie in our veterans' hospitals or struggle for recovery in rehabilitation centers. They suffer from post-traumatic stress and survivor's guilt. They yearn for peace in their souls. Dear God, we ask you to heal their wounds, to banish whatever inner demons may haunt them and to give them peace within so that they may return fully to their families and to society. We thank you today, God, for all of our country's veterans, those of past generations, and those who continue to earn this title today. May we never forget what our country has asked of them and what they have given in return. Help us to give them the respect and honor they are due and strengthen our resolve to build a world modeled on your realm where war will be pursued no more. This we ask in the name of Jesus, the Prince of Peace. Amen. Good morning and welcome to Church on the Couch. I'm Pastor Jeff and I'm actually worshiping today from uh, my office setting in Baldwinsville, where I also serve. And uh, we just heard that beautiful salute from Diana Gardner, who is uh, offering special music today. And we have also heard from Lisa Kisselstein, who is also doing special music this morning. And we have also heard, you've heard from us all already, early, Sue Candy, who is the organist and choir director at Pennsylvania United Methodist Church. So welcome 
to the three of you and welcome to all of you on the couch. It's our blessing this morning to be here with you. Join your hearts with mine and let us offer this prayer to God. Let us pray. God of unlimited grace, gather us in to this place, to this time. Meet us in this moment, we pray. Lord God, in the midst of a time of anxiousness surrounding our national election, may we be reminded of the blessing of freedom that we experience. May we be reminded of the fact that we as a nation are united by the free right to vote. And may we be reminded, even more importantly, that you are the one who unites our hearts. That you, through Christ Jesus, bring us together this day. Lord God, you know the prayers of the people. You, and only you, know the vibrations of our heart. You know those things that trouble us this day. You know the pain of grief. You also know the joys that we experience and celebrate each day. Meet us in those. Hold us in, that, in those times of trouble. Dance with us in those times of joy. Lord God, be with each one in whatever it is that they're experiencing this day. And continue to bless each one of us to be a blessing. We pray all of these things in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Our hymn this morning that uh, leads us into our gospel reading is I'm going to live so God can use me. And it's an African-American spiritual. And I'm going to just read the simple lyrics for you so that you may sing in response this morning. I'm going to live so God can use me anywhere, Lord, anytime. And you repeat that. I'm going to work so God can use me anywhere, Lord, anytime. And I'm going to pray so God can use me anywhere, Lord, anytime.
Our gospel reading this morning comes to us from the gospel according to Mark, chapter 12, verses 38 to 44. Hear this word. As he taught, Jesus said, watch out for the teachers of the law. They like to walk around in flowing robes and be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and have the most important seats in the synagogue and the places of honor at banquets. They devour widows' houses and for a show make lengthy prayers. These men will be punished severely. Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts, but a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worthy only of a few cents. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They all gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all she had to live on. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. Fall afresh on each one of us gathered here so that both speaker and hearer will know your will for us today. Amen. The words, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength are familiar words to us. We hear them here in Deuteronomy and we hear them again in the gospel spoken by Jesus as he reframes these into the two greatest commandments. If you think that you have heard these scriptures so much that you could recite them by heart, then I think God would say to us, good, we're halfway there. These words are part of the ancient Shema, Israel's best known and perhaps its most sacred prayer, the prayer that is recited daily and is the last prayer that is spoken on the holiest day of Yom Kippur. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. Love your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Then the instructions to take them to heart, to impress them to your children, recite them at home and away when you lie down and when you get up. In other words, know this as well as you know yourself and live it. Live it as part of your daily life. Why God might say we're halfway there is because learning it, knowing it, hearing it over and over doesn't always translate to living it. When Jesus said these words, he paired them with the command to love your neighbor as yourself, reminding us that to love God with everything we have is lived out by how we love one another. In the gospel passage that we read, Jesus had just spoken these two commandments, familiar words strung together to help those who love God and follow Jesus truly understand God's call on our lives. And we see this ongoing tension between knowing those holy words and living them out when Jesus, in real time, after he talks about the greatest commandment, criticizes the scribes and religious elite for the way they appear and behave. He said they walk around looking down upon most of society and mistreat the poorest and most vulnerable. They devour the widow's houses, Jesus says, underscoring how they are not loving neighbor as self and certainly not loving God with all their heart and their soul and their mind and their strength. As he said this, he witnessed the gathered putting their money in the offering including the poor widow who gave two coins, which could have been most of or all of what she possessed. Even though the others clearly gave more than the widow, Jesus suggests that it's her giving because it was given out of her poverty, not her abundance, that was the most genuine act. Even though she has far less money, her giving isn't about what she has left, it's about what she has. 
This reminds me of a story that I read a long time ago. It's called Why the Chimes Rang. It was written by Raymond MacDonald Alden in 1909. The story begins with those familiar words. There once was in a faraway country where people have traveled a wonderful church. Now, this church stood high on a hill, and thousands climbed the hill to go to church every Sunday and on sacred holidays like Christmas. It was a huge church. In fact, the sanctuary was so long that you could just barely see the front from the back. The church was known for its beautiful choir and its magnificent organ, but the thing that really stood out were the Christmas bells. They were said to be the most beautiful of all chimes. Some describe them as sounding like angels singing far up in the sky. But the thing is, no one had heard these bells in the longest time. They were only to be played on Christmas and not meant to be played by common men or women. It was a custom on Christmas Eve for all the people to bring their offering to the Christ child. And when the greatest and best offering was laid on the altar, the chimes would play. Now maybe it was the wind, maybe it was angels swinging those chimes, but those chimes would then play. It was said that the people had been growing less careful with their gifts to the Christ child and that no offering was brought that was great enough to deserve the music of the beautiful chimes. So that year, to get those chimes ringing, everyone paid special attention to what they were wearing and what they were going to bring to the baby Jesus that year. So there they were on Christmas Eve, dressed in their finest, parading up that hill. Miles away lived a boy named Pedro and his little brother, and they had heard how beautiful the church was and how special Christmas Eve was in that church. They had even heard that sometimes the Christ child himself will come down to bless the service. So they snuck away and made their way to the church. As they were walking their on their way there, the snow started to fall, making it hard to travel. Just as they got outside the city gates, they saw that this poor woman had fallen into the snow and she appeared to be too sick to finish the trip. Well, the boy stopped to help her and tried to get her up and were even willing to carry her to church, but she was too frail and too sick. So finally, Pedro said to his little brother, it's no use. You'll have to go on alone. Pedro was sad, but he knew that he must stay, and he didn't think that both boys needed to miss that service. So he persuaded his little brother to go on. And before he let him go, Pedro asked his little brother if he would sneak up to the front of the church and put this little piece of silver offering in the collection. The little brother left, and in a few minutes he was at the church, and it was magnificent, beyond description. And the service was incredible. Finally, the time for came for the procession of offerings to the altar. And the rich and well-dressed and important people of the town rose, and they began to strut down that very long aisle. Some brought baskets of jewels and gold. One famous writer even offered a book that he had written. So far, the chimes remained silent. At last, the country's king came forward, hoping that his bounty would get those chimes ringing. He laid his crown on the altar setting off this murmur around the crowd. Surely the chimes would ring tonight. But still, the chimes remained silent. People began to doubt if the chimes even worked. The 
The choir began with their closing hymn. And then suddenly, softly, you could hear the chimes. It seemed so far away, but so clear. The beautiful chimes played. Everyone stood up and stared straight at the altar to see what gift was it that had awakened those long silent bells. But all they saw was the little brother sneaking away from the altar, making his way down that long aisle so he could quickly return to his brother and that poor woman in the snow. He went unnoticed. He didn't appear to be the greatest gift. It wasn't a book or a crown. It wasn't even anything that was noticeable. But he indeed did give the greatest gift. He gave the gift of love. The boys and the widow gave an offering that reflected their love for God. The extravagance of the gift wasn't the value in the coins, but the authenticity of the gift and the devotion of the giver. Giving is about money, but those coins represent a lot more than just money. They represent an offering that is about faith, what we believe and how we live it out. To live in those commands to love is to live intentionally and sincerely, giving out of what we are and whose we are, not of who we are and whose we are, not about what we want to be and what we want others to think about us. To love with all that we are, our, our whole selves, is to give our whole selves. And that might not be extravagant. It might not be noticeable, but it'll be real because it'll be you. It could be the giving of your time, of helping, of being, of serving. It could be our resources, including our money. It could be giving of our giftedness and it could be a combination of those things. The challenge then is never about how impressive or fancy or noteworthy our gift is, or whether or not we can live up to others' expectations, but rather about living into God's love for us by really loving God with all our heart and our soul and our mind and our strength by living it out in all that we do, in all that we are. It's then that we, our whole selves, are our offering. We're the offering. And we are our greatest gift back to God. Amen. Let us pray this prayer of confession. Gracious God, so often we look at ourselves, our gifts and our talents, and wonder what you would do with these offerings. We don't think that we have much to give. So far, too many times we belittle the gifts and turn our backs on the needs and opportunities present to serve, believing that our gifts cannot possibly make a difference. We think that we must possess the greatest of talents and wealth in order to truly please and serve you. How foolish we are. Forgive us when we stop listening to your healing and comforting words and focus on our anxieties. Heal us, Lord. Help us know that you have given to us such blessings and that these blessings are truly wonderful and meant to be used to joy and service to others. Help us to bring our lives just as they are to you and to receive your gentle touch and healing grace. So we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. God has given to each of us such blessings and talents. 
with joy we bring these gifts to God. You are blessed by God's absolute love for you. Rejoice in that love and find healing and hope. Amen. Give what you can when you can't do anybody who looks like they need a friend. It might be just a mite, words of hope, a cup of water, some shelter when the night is closing in. Just take a little time, settle into a favor, lace your shoes, and walk that extra mile. You're gonna be a whole lot of good way to see that former stranger's darkness smile. You can make a little difference, you can even change your life. It's never been a waste of time. You can shine a little light in a world of dark and strife, and you know you're never gonna miss that nickel or dime. It's gonna be the style, more people in a smile do a good thing. You multiply that by two. Each one, each one passing love around you. So happy it started with you. Love is a word that's meant for everybody. The saints and our sinners every day. The weak and the strong, the rich and the poor. Whether we are at work or play. So when you meet somebody on that long highway of life, who's carrying a heavy load, offer to help with whatever you can. It'll help you both down that dusty road. You can make a little difference. You can even change your life. It's never been a waste of time. You can shine a little light in the world of dark and strife. And you know you're never going to miss that silly old dime. It's going to be the style for people in a smile. Do a good thing. You multiply by two. Each one, each one, pests and love around you. Be so happy that started with you. Let's start a pandemic of love. Happy you started with you. We're gonna do it. Start all over the world. Let's go. Amen. The next moment that we were to spend together was called bringing our gifts. And they're here. Here they are. They've been brought, and it's a blessing. And I think the challenge for us and the invitation is for us to see that, be open to that, and to share that. As you have seen these gifts shared today, the different kinds of music, the beautiful expressions. And I thought as we prayed that prayer of confession, those are the prayers in our heart that we should reflect on each and every day. Friends, as you hear the closing hymn today, The Gift of Love, think about what it means to give and to receive that gift of love.
bear witness to the love of God in this world so that those to whom love is a stranger will find in you a generous friend. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always. Amen.